fact, or mm-hmm. um, I mean, c- Christian humanism from a from a Catholic perspective has two sides. One is the positive affirmation of secularity and the world, and the and modernity as it has evolved and differentiated into different uh, spheres of activity in society. Um, and on the other hand, it has a uh, cleansing effect, uh, uh, which means cleansing, cleaning the world, purifying the world of sin, which is what really spoils and mars God's creation. So on the affirmative side, we can say, well, this is a consequence of our belief in incarnation, God who assumes in his Son uh, all of creation, uh, all of mankind, and uh, also human work, uh, human family, even human suffering, even even death, and redeems it. Um, and on the other on the other hand, uh, we we have the cross, we have uh, the overcoming of evil, we have this transformation, uh, which uh, Jesus brought about in the Eucharist and on the cross in the Eucharist, because he uh, in the Last Supper gives a new meaning to pass to the passion what would have been simply hatred and destroyal becomes love and construction reconstruction so um, just to briefly sketch the the path which catholic the catholic concept of uh, this positive christian humanism took um, we had to overcome uh, obstacles which which were m- mainly the rejection of the Lutheran concept of common priesthood at the Council of Trent, which was not directed against the common priesthood, but it was against the exclusivity and the rejection by Luther of ministerial priesthood and of special vocations to holiness uh, in the religious orders. So, um, in the as a consequence of the Council of Trent, the emphasis was so strongly placed on the hierarchy and on ministerial priesthood that the calling to holiness of the laity just faded into the background. And uh, this is an obstacle for Christian humanism because it d- doesn't bring uh, positive secularity and life in the world uh, into the center of attention. Uh, the, the, the interest was simply placed on the holiness of the priests because they had to be protected against the temptations of the world. And of course, if the world is seen under this light or in this light as a temptation, then you, you're you not going to be interested or not going to dedicate a lot of energy to developing a positive theological reflection on what the world is. Mm-hmm. So this was one, uh, uh, one obstacle. And the second obstacle was anti-liberalism. Uh, this has to do with the shock of the French Revolution. Uh, because the French Revolution from more or less the beginning, uh, not the very, very beginning, but very soon in its unfolding, became persecutory. It started persecuting the, the church. It started killing priests. It's, it, it, it demanded uh, a, a, an oath of uh, loyalty to the civil constitution. So uh, the church reacted with shock and horror and uh, rejected this new phenomenon of liberalism, this uh, independence of uh, political thought, independence of economic activity, independence of scientific thought, because it was conceived as something which went against went, went against faith. Now, of course, this is a difficulty for Christian humanism, because um, it is a rejection of secularity in the modern sense, which is characterized by the differentiation of independent or relatively autonomous spheres of economic activity in the secular sphere, in the, in the, sec- in the world. So um, these difficulties were overcome in time by Pope Leo XIII, who um, revived the Thomist philosophy, the philosophy of Thomas Aquinas, mm-hmm. who underlined the unity of nature and grace, saying that grace, redemption, revelation, Christ, doesn't destroy nature, but elevates, heals, presupposes nature, so there's a unity, and, um, and also uh, by the experience of 
Christian politicians who were active in democracies and who were able to make the liberal system drop its aggressive attitude towards faith and also by the experience of the church of the Catholic Church in America because there you had uh, Christians and Catholics living in a democracy with human rights and with religious freedom and it was the part of the world where the Catholic Church grew the most so uh, this experience brought a mu mutual rapprochement of uh, modernity and the church at the Second Vatican Council. Of course there were also theological ferments in the church. I'm thinking of Nouvelle Théologie. I also think of Jacques Maritain. I also think of uh, Jose Maria Escriva and Opus Dei with this idea of secularity and holiness, calling to holiness in the world. So all these things uh, resulted in the Second Vatican Council that firmly placed the role of the church in civil society, fully accepting m the differentiation of modern spheres of action and activity in the world, at the same time uh, maintaining the public character of Christian religion and calling on the lay people who were reminded that they are called to holiness, not by vows, but through the mere fact of baptism. Mm. So this was the, the big change in the Vatican Council and therefore for the Catholic for a Catholic concept of Christian humanism, the Second Vatican Council still is the the main point of reference and the main source of uh, theological inspiration. Mm. Now um, the Second Vatican Council was characterized by a great optimism and a great trust in society. And Unfortunately, uh, this distrust that was based on the more or less universal conformity and consensus in values between society and the church as regards, for instance, the right to life, there was no abortion, there was no euthanasia, there, was no embryo, there were no embryo experiments uh, as regards marriage. Divorce did exist, but it was limited to certain cases. Uh, there was no idea of gay marriage. Um, there uh, was no notion uh, of in vitro fertilization or, or, or insemination outside of wedlock. So all these things didn't exist. But in, in only three years after the end of the Second Vatican Council, 1965 was the end of the Second Vatican Council, 1968 we had the sexual revolution, we had the student revolts, so and the beginning of the um, disintegration of the existing consensus and values. So now we, we, uh, we encounter the difficulty that what the church heralded and welcomed as a Christian idea, or as an idea which is compatible with Christian heritage, the human rights, um, the rule of law, uh, in demo democracies and liberal states is being used as a weapon to argue against Christian anthropology. Mm -hmm. So in the same language, in the rights language, which were the language of the modern narrative of the emancipation of man and woman mm -hmm. in, in free societies, these are now being used, the same language is being used to undermine the moral foundations of our free societies. Uh, take for example the word reproductive rights. They are, they mean, in uh, speaking clearly, abortion. Uh, take anti-discrimination, uh, which is a, a big achievable we, we, which we have to maintain, is now being used to speak of gay marriage, which uh, is a discrimination of heterosexual couples. No? So, um, now all these things have uh, brought about the conviction that uh, even though there are so many positive things in, in, in modern culture, in contemporary culture, so many uh, Christian, um, or how should I put it, so many results of Christian tradition in, in our modern society, that we are in a cultural crisis in the Western world. And that now Christian humanism uh, has the, the task to 
purify and cleanse this uh, situation through a process of cultural transformation, which um, I think is a combination of values, practices, and institutions. And I combine these three elements, these three conveyor belts of cultural transformation with the classical transcendentals of truth, goodness, and beauty. Hmm. And um, so I think that in, in a world which is so uh, full of struggle and difficulties, what people need is truth, is practical truth, is values. Uh, because you can build hope, which is the motor of change and, 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 and the reason why we struggle, you can only build hope on truth. One word of truth weighs more than the whole world, is, is what Alexander Solzhenitsyn said in his Nobel Prize lecture, it's the end. Um, so this also has a biblical root if you take the, the Hebrew word for truth, which is emet. It means re reliability, trustworthiness. Mm. Um, so truth is something I can rely on. I can build my hope on it. And Christian humanism approaches the world uh, saying, we believe in truth. We're not telling you stories. We believe that Christ has truly risen that he's truly alive, that he's there, that he's truly your redeemer. Ex uh, accept his help. We, we can argue about whether you believe it as well, whether you can believe it, but we offer it to you as truth. So it, this in, in, the, in the middle of a postmodernist society that rejects or doesn't know truth, or doesn't accept the concept of truth, uh, at least uh, we present, present the world with the concept of truth and with true values and with practical truth. Um, but that alone would not be enough. It's not enough to speak of values. You have to live them. Mm -hmm. And that we do with practices, our virtues. And if we want to transmit our values, the best way to do so is to live them and to uh, be a role model. Uh, people don't really need, well, let's put it this way, people need teachers who are role models. Only being a, te only being a teacher, only being a sign which shows the way but doesn't go along with you is not enough. It's not convincing enough. And the third, uh, third uh, conveyor belt of cultural transformations are institutions. Because this is an insight uh, which is at the root of the American experience, of the founding fathers, who realized that it would not be enough for, uh, for a person in power to be virtuous. Because a king may be virtuous, but who knows whether his son will be virtuous. So what they did is they harnessed the antagonistic forces in politics, economics, and an individual moral life into a system which serves the common good. And they harness it with a system of checks and balances and institutions, of independent institutions. And this is, a, I think, a very important insight because... We do not live our values individually. We live them in the institutions we jointly construct. Mm -hmm. Take freedom. We, freedom, if we are alone, alone in this world, and we alone are free, we're not really free, we're lost. Because our life, our freedom doesn't make sense. We, our freedom makes sense when we share it with, with others. Mm -hmm. So I think these are the, the, the main tenets of Christian humanism in a Catholic perspective as, as, as I see them. Mm -hmm.